eyewitness to successful secession movements. Now, with the critical national elections in South Africa coming up in May, 29th of May, I believe, Wednesday the 29th of May, discussions and arguments concerning devolution, decentralization, provincial powers, autonomy and self-determination for the Western Cape in particular is heating up in the media. And with Sona, according to Cyril Ramposa, everything's getting so much better and so wonderful and with load shedding behind us, you know, what's there to complain about? But for those of us living in the real world, uh, we don't see things quite the same way as the cancer in Parliament do. In fact, there's a coalition now of opposition parties that are cooperating together to try and replace the ANC, hoping to see the ANC and EFF brought below 50% so that uh, they can then form a government of uh, national unity, some kind of coalition government. And yet, one of those leaders, the DA leader, John Steenhuisen, declared this last weekend that secession is stupid and unworkable, quote unquote. Well, tonight's presentation is to show how stupid uh, that comment is and how ignorant DA leader Steenhuisen actually is. We've been involved in campaigning for Cape Independence for quite a while. And there's been a lot of thought and discussion that's gone on even in this very upper room here, where we've had leaders from many different political parties and strategists and businessmen discussing the practicalities of it. Now, as a missionary who for over 40 years has concentrated on serving persecuted churches in restricted access areas, I've traveled in 42 countries, worked in 38 countries across four continents, and I've seen quite a lot of secessions. So my ministry is included throughout Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. At the end of the Second World War, Eastern Europe was divided up and the West basically betrayed over 150 million Christians in 10 different countries into the hands of Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union. They annexed a whole lot of areas and then they built an Iron Curtain from, Tries uh, from Stettin in the north to Triesk in the south and they built an iron curtain, a barrier of steel and wire and burglar, uh, all kinds of landmines and obstacle courses, but separating the communist Warsaw Pact East from NATO and Western Europe um, in the West. Communism became the reality of life for the poor people in Eastern Europe. And biggest obstacle course ever constructed in the time of man between the East and West. I started smuggling Bibles into Eastern Europe back in the 80s, and in fact, even on my honeymoon, I went with Bill Bathman, after whom this hall is named in memory of, and you can see some of the memorials of Bill Bathman, who was a contemporary of Richard Vaughan, Brother Andrew, and other people working behind the Iron Curtain. So I was trying to keep up with my father-in-law racing in the car ahead with my bride next to me as we went to Eastern Europe. She took some of these pictures. One of our first places was Czech Czechoslovakia. Now, Czechoslovakia, under the megalomaniac Ceausescu, who thought he was a modern Caesar, they had over 8,000 hymns of praise composed for the praise of Ceausescu, the dictator of Romania. The school children would have to sing his praises before school every day. All the buildings had all kinds of laurels and banners proclaiming how wonderful Ceausescu was. And on May Day, the 1st of May, main high day of the communists, they would have the communist flags, and notice these communist flags, not only the Soviet Union's, but Red China's flags and Vietnam's flags intermingled, with the UN's flags coming dutifully behind. And you see the idol of Lenin. They were talking about, you have the world to win. In fact, just look at these flags. These flags here, not just of all the communist countries in the world on May Day, but even non-communist countries like India. And I think you can see some flags here like Spain. And there's Norway. And uh, that's Ireland's flag, Texas. Many of these countries are definitely not communist, like Spain there. But they've got the globe reminding you have a world to win. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Work as the world unites. And you could see communism as a missionary religion. They wanted to win the world for Karl Marx and for atheism. And they were not just aiming at the uh, countries that were already communist, aiming for the entire world. Now, this is also interesting. 1st of May, notice the flags. Starting on the right, Hungary, North Korea, China, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria. 
Now, wait a minute. Isn't there meant to be a Sino-Soviet split? Why is Red China's flag up there and North Korea's? They're all, and Yugoslavia is meant to be the leader of the non-aligned nations. It just shows on May Day, all that subterfuge disappeared. In fact, all these communist countries were working together all along. Albania was declared the first truly atheistic country in the world. They killed the last minister, changed the last church into the Cuban embassy, and literally dragged one of the ministers down the street behind a vehicle till he is in pieces, and declared in 1966, really, the first truly atheistic country in the world, Albania. Nobody believes in God anymore. I met a person who had spent 10 years in a concentration camp because he had whispered to a friend to encourage him, God bless you. And that got him 10 years in the labor camp. They actually had blocking devices all over Albania to block anyone receiving any radio or TV signals from anywhere outside of the country. They even manufactured radios that were frozen on the government station so that people couldn't uh, accidentally tune into Radio Free Europe or Transworld Radio or something like that. Now, when I first visited Yugoslavia, I heard people in Croatia speaking about the need for independence. Well, I was highly skeptical. I mean, communism has been a reality. I didn't think the Berlin Wall was coming down before Jesus returned. I was pretty convinced that uh, the Berlin Wall would be up for the rest of my life. I couldn't have imagined the Iron Curtain coming down with these communist countries going free. Yugoslavia at that time consisted of six republics, five nations, four languages, three major religions, two alphabets, two calendars, mind you, but only one political party, the Communist Party. And this was the flag of communist Yugoslavia, the Red Star of Bronze Tito. In 1990, the first multi-party elections were held in Croatia. And on 25 June 1991, Croatia actually declared its independence from Yugoslavia, which came into effect 8th of October 1991. And by 15th of January 92, Croatia was recognized as an independent country by the European Economic Community. Croatia is actually a beautiful country. Yugoslavia means the land of the South Slavs. Well, Croatia is not Slo Slavic, it's Germanic. Uh, Slovenia uh, and Croatia were part of the Austrian Empire. The aggression by Yugoslavia was effectively ended by August 1995 with a decisive victory by Croatia. And since then, the 5th of August has been observed as a victory and homeland Thanksgiving Day. In Slovenia, it was similar. Now, again, Slovenia and Croatia are both Germanic, not Slavic. So this Yugoslavia is a bad idea from the beginning. Yugoslavia is a creation of the Versailles Treaty, the vindictive Versailles Treaty, which must be the worst treaty in the history of the world. It created the Second World War, made the Second World War essential. Yugoslavia is just designed as a punishment to Austria and to cut up Austria and Hungary and to create whole new entities. Yugoslavia never existed before 1918. It's not existed since the Iron Curtain came down. So in Slovenia, they started to publish the case for independence in 1987, and the Committee for the Defense of Human Rights was formed. Demands for democratization and independence for Slovenia forced the communist government to enact a number of democratic reforms. In September 1989, Constitutional amendments were passed to introduce parliamentary democracy to Slovenia. How radical is that? On the 7th of March 1990, the Slovenian Assembly changed the official name of the state to the Republic of Slovenia. In April 1990, the first democratic elections in Slovenia took place. All this after the Berlin Wall came down. 23rd December 1990, more than 88% of the electorate voted in a referendum for a sovereign independence Slovenia. They declared the independence 25th of June 1991. And the Yugoslav People's Army invaded on the 27th of June 1991. And this resulted in what's been called the 10-day war. The result was the Brugini Agreement and the withdrawal of the Yugoslav army from Slovenia. In December 1991, a new constitution was adopted following by laws of denationalization and privatization of state enterprises, 1992. And the members of the European Union recognized Slovenia as an independent state, 15th of January 1992. That all happened very fast. So fast made your head spin. The things that were happening with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 onwards is absolutely extraordinary. So now you've got seven different independent countries where once there was this Yugoslavia, which was a, a shockingly bad idea. And uh, to this day, Yugoslavia does not exist anymore. When I first traveled to Bratislava in Czechoslovakia, 
talk of the Slavi Slovakians seceding from Czechoslovakia seemed very unrealistic and impossible. Berlin Wall, Iron Curtain, people trying to protest against Soviet tanks here in Berlin, for example, East Berlin, all the people could do was throw stones against T-34 tanks. But protests came when Stalin died in the 1950s. Um, there was an uprising in, Yugos in Hungary. People were burning their portraits of Joseph Stalin and of Lenin, and they toppled the great statue to Lenin in uh, Budapest, the capital of Hungary. And the people started to protest, Russians out of Hungary. All of Eastern Europe had been occupied by the Soviet army, and now Eastern Europe wanted its freedom. And uh, the Hungarians were convinced that the West would come and help them. Surely NATO, America, Britain, I mean, they all believe in democracy, don't they? And freedom and self-determination. Well, instead, the Soviets sent the tanks in, and there was protests, and people tried to defend themselves, but the Soviet tanks just rolled over everything. And they turned the center of, of Budapest into one big mess. Um, you can see dead bodies on the streets and just burnt out things. This looks like the Second World War damage. This is 1956 in Budapest, in Hungary. Soviets just came in shooting and destroying things. Same thing happened in 1968 when Czechoslovakia tried to have communism with a human face. Totally failed. And the Soviets ringed Czechoslovakia with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tanks, poured in, caused chaos. The people were throwing stones at the tanks. And the tanks came right in to uh, Prague and literally drove over cars, flattened cars. My father-in-law, Bill Bathman, uh, wrote in his book, going through how when the Soviets were invading Czechoslovakia, he phoned his friend, brother Andrew in Netherlands, said, I'll meet you in Vincela Square. And they raced there, although Bill Batham got there first because he is traveling from just Salzburg, which is much closer. And uh, so as everyone is pouring out of Czechoslovakia by the hundreds of thousands, two men were going in, brother Andrew and Bill Batham. And they were taking hundreds of Russian New Testaments so that as the Russians were invading Prague, they were literally climbing up the tanks, handing uh, the Russians Bibles in the Russian language. They thought, well, if the communists are coming to us, let's take the gospel to them. And the, Bill Bathman said he saw these tanks coming into Vincela Square and driving straight over trucks and cars and shaving off the sides of vehicles parked on the side of the road. And these tanks would just literally rip through these vehicles and leave them burning in the streets. And this is a typical traffic jam in Prague in 1968 what was called the Prague Spring. And the local people letting the Russians know what they thought of them. Uh, this picture, I believe, is taken Bratislava, Bill Bathman and his team in front of the Soviet-type art. Communist art is very unimaginative. The Christians were adamant Slovakia must become an independent country. But what chance did they have, considering what happened to Hungary and to Czechoslovakia in the past? But there was tremendous uprising in 1989, and one country after the other in Eastern Europe toppled the communist regimes. And following the collapse of communist rule in Czechoslovakia in 1989, with the withdrawal of the Soviet Red Army, the Slovak Socialist Republic was renamed the Slovak Republic. And on the 17th of June 1992, Slovakia declared itself a sovereign state, meaning its laws took precedence over those of the federal government. Throughout the autumn of 1992, negotiations with the Czech government resulted in a vote referendum in, 19, in 1992, 31st of December, to dissolve Czechoslovakia. So the Slovak Republic and the Czech Republic went their separate ways from the 1st of January 1993. Now, the overthrow of communist rule in Czechoslovakia had been called the Velvet Revolution because it had been pretty bloodless. So the peaceful separation of Czech and Slovakia was called the Velvet Divorce. Obviously, the Czechs believed in doing things in a more polite way. Next, there's the Baltic states. Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are three Baltic states which were occupied over the centuries by Sweden, Poland, and Russia. And the Republic of Slo Slo Latvia was established 18th of November 1918 when it seceded from the Soviet Union. 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, 1918, the Baltic states said, we're out of here, we don't need this. And they formed the independent states again and withdrew from the S Soviet Union. <coughs> well, 1940, Latvia was invaded by the Soviet Union, but the next year, Latvia was liberated by German forces during Operation Barbarossa in 1941. And then again, in 1944, the Soviet Red Army again invaded Latvia, forced it back into the Soviet Union. But starting in 1987, 
The singing revolution called for Baltic emancipation from communism and from Soviet occupation. The singing revolution is an example of, of how, you know, I'm not going to call it the cultural revolution because that smacks of what Mao Zedong did, destroying the culture in China. But this is the singing revolution they called in the Baltic states. They couldn't protest, but they could celebrate their culture. So you better to light a candle and curse the darkness. And so in the Baltic states, they start to have concerts celebrating their heritage and their culture. And this was a quiet, peaceful, melodic way of celebrating their independence. On the 4th of May 1990, the Declaration of the Restoration of the Independence of the Republic of Latvia was issued. And on 21st of August 1991, Latvia declared its independence from the Soviet Union. And here they are celebrating their independence in Latvia. Latvia has since been declared the capital of culture in Europe. Its capital, Riga, has hosted the Choir Olympics, which my daughter Daniela, as part of the Cape Town Youth Choir, participated in. Over 140 choirs from around the world gathered in Riga for this event. In the year that Daniela was there, I think that was 2014, Stellenbosch University's choir won internationally. That's quite amazing that South Africans could have such a great impact at the Choir Olympics. Absolutely phenomenal operation. These people believe in singing. That's how they won the independence, by singing. Estonia was also occupied over the centuries by Polish, Swedish and Russian forces, and they declared the independence 24th of February 1918, after the Bolshevik Revolution. On the 6th of August 1940, Estonia was invaded, occupied by the Soviet Red Army, incorporated in the Soviet Union. Liberated in 41, again crushed by the Soviets in 1944. The Estonians continued to resist the Soviet occupation for years after the Second World War. The Forest Brothers resistance movement rose up to oppose the Soviet policies of collectivization, which means you lose your farm and everyone's forced into uh, a collective farm. You know, it might have been your grandfather's farm, now you work as a slave on it for the state. And the forced removals of Estonians to Siberia to make way for Russian immigration, population replacement. And these are some of the Forest Brothers, some of the anti-communist resistance movements fighting against the Soviets for nine years after the Second World War was over. Right up to 1954, um, they were still in the forest resisting. In 1987, the singing revolution began, and by 1988, the Popular Front of Estonia became the standard bearer for Estonian independence. The Estonian National Independence Party was the first non-communist party in the whole of the Soviet Union. It demanded full restoration of its independence. And lots of singing, candlelight ceremonies. Estonia never joined the Soviet Union. 16th of November 1988, the Estonian Supreme Soviet issued a sovereignty declaration asserting the primacy of Estonian laws over Soviet laws. And on the 23rd of August 1989, about 2 million Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians participated in a mass demonstration forming the Baltic Way human chain. Now we know about life chains. Well, as the human chain across the three republics demanding restoration of independence, 2 million people spread out along the side of the road singing and protesting for their independence and for their sovereignty. These are some of the historic pictures. 1990, the Congress of Estonia was formed as a representative body of Estonian citizens. In March 1991, a referendum was held where 77% of the voters supported independence. And some of the celebrations in 1990 as they celebrate the independence, a Moscow coup attempt was exposed and resisted and Estonia declared its restoration of independence 20th of August 1990, which is now observed as a national holiday in Estonia. The last units of the Red Army left Estonia in 1994. They had to just ignore them for a while until they basically just left. At first, the Soviets didn't want to recognize that Estonia was independent. In 1992, Estonia launched economic reforms for privatization and free market economy. In 2004, Estonia joined the European Union and NATO. And Every year they celebrate their independence and their freedom. And Estonia is called the singing nation. Lithuania is seceded from the Soviet Union on 16th of February 1918 to form the Republic of Lithuania, liberated, uh, well, invaded by the Soviets in 1940 uh, by Stalin's Red Army. Uh, they then were reincorporated in the Soviet Union in 1944 after the Second World War. On 11th of March 1990, a year before the formal dissolution of the Soviet Union, 
Lithuania became the first Baltic state to declare itself independent. 11 March 1990, the Supreme Council announced the restoration of Lithuania's independence. 28 March 1990, the USSR imposed an economic blockade on Lithuania, and the blockade lasted 74 days. No exports allowed out, no imports allowed in. But Lithuania stood firm under effective siege, serious sanctions. When the Soviet Union attempted a coup in Lithuania, storming the Simas Palace, Lithuanians vigorously defended the council and inspired other Soviet republics to secede from the Union. Soviets used um, nerve gas, all sorts of things, the things they did to try and crush the people in Lithuania. Absolutely hideous, and this was happening under Gorbachev, who many people were cheering as a great leader of freedom. Gorbachev was no f uh, friend of freedom at all. Shortly after 11th of February, 1991, the Parliament of Iceland voted to confirm Iceland's recognition of Lithuania independence in 1922 and said, it's still in effect, we never formally recognized the Soviet Union's occupation of Lithuania. So Iceland stated full diplomatic relations would be re-established as soon as possible. 25th of October 1992, the citizens of Lithuania voted in a referendum to adopt their new constitution. And finally, 31st of August 1993, the last units of the Russian army withdrew from Lithuanian territory. By this time, uh, the Red Army had been dissolved, the Soviet Union had been dissolved, so now it's the Russian army. But they finally had to leave Lithuanian territory after trying to pretend for a long time you're still part of the Russian Federation. And finally, they had to admit, no, we're not. Since 2004, Lithuania has become a member of NATO and of the European Union. And here are some of the celebrations of Lithuania's independence, very beautiful territories, the Baltic states, a lot of Scandinavian influence, a lot of Germanic influence, and many of these people are descendants of the Vikings. Now, the so-called Soviet Union consisted of many different nations. Uh, and remember, the old Russia consisted of 11 time zones, the largest country on the planet. And even here, you can see National Geographic recognizing some of the different peoples, nations, linguistic groups in Soviet Union. Notice they even had a tribe of astronauts. So all kinds of strange peoples here. And uh, in 1991, effectively, Russia broke up into 15 different parts. Soviet Union broke up into 15 different independent states, including the Russian Federation. And that's the reality we face today. Russia no longer is the Soviet Union, no longer possesses Finland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, all these places have broken free. And these are now independent countries. Now, some people say, like the DA leader, Stenhausen, says, secession is stupid and unworkable. Well, thankfully, it wasn't stupid or unworkable for Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, or any of these other countries there. And since 1995, I've been involved in the campaign for South Sudan's independence. From 1995 to 2002, I conducted 27 missions to Sudan, walking across the length and breadth of the Nuba Mountains as well in central Sudan. And this is when it was one of the most besieged, beleaguered places on earth, one of the most dangerous places on earth for Christians. Churches being bombed, Christians being attacked, and we went behind enemy lines uh, in the 1040 window, just south of the Sahara Desert, helping the persecuted church, walking across what sometimes looked like lunar landscape. Scorpions at night could kill multiple scorpions at night. We were on our sleeping bags before we could try and get to sleep. And even baobab trees up there sort of remind one of Rodiga. And the Nuba Mountains is just one little island of Christianity in the Sea of Islam, fighting for its independence from Sudan. In South Sudan, the church was under relentless bombardment, this is an Episcopal church of Sudan, a building that was bombed uh, by MIG and hot shrapnel uh, took the whole uh, thatched roof uh, aflame. And here's the Episcopal pastor and his deacon standing in the ashes of what used to be a beautiful church. This church was destroyed by helicopter gunships. Another church destroyed by Arab forces, helicopter gunships. Lots of bombing. We've experienced multiple bombings. And in dry season, the whole bush just catches flame. And that's the kind of scorches. And this isn't just destroying bushes. It's destroying wildlife, um, domestic animals, people. Exterior decorating by Muhammad and sons. The Muslim government, National Islamic Front government of Sudan did a lot of destruction. 
This is the birthplace of Christianity in San Salen. Fraser Cathedral in Louis. You can see the crosses, gravestones of missionaries who planted the church there and laid the foundations for freedom in uh, South Sudan. We've been under fire during church services in Sudan multiple times and seen many a church bombed. I've had 1,200 services in Sudan and I don't think I ever preached in a church that hadn't been bombed at least once. In some cases, in this case, this church had been bombed 10 times, destroyed three times and rebuilt each time. Uh, Louis Cathedral, Fraser Cathedral in Louis. You can see the tail end of a plane that crashed at the end of the run right there. We would go in with Bibles on the first flight and our um, exit flight would bring in food normally that we pre-positioned in order to give to the pastors to take back to the villages to care for widows and orphans because the government's policy was scorched earth, tumsit, combing, destroying everything necessary to sustain life. And at one time I saw something that just... Um, my mind couldn't register what I was seeing. A man who actually didn't have any legs, I see I don't actually have that picture where his feet were axed off by the Arabs for being an evangelist. Well, we delivered over half a million Bibles and books in 24 languages throughout southern Sudan and Nuba Mountains during that time. And smuggling in these Bibles it involved flying behind enemy lines, these contraband uh, banned scriptures, helping people like the Dinka and uh, providing the chaplains in the south with training and with Bibles, Sunday school materials, hymn books, prayer books for the churches amongst the Bari, the Moro, the Zandi, uh, Dinka, the Nuer, um, Bibles as textbooks for the schools, and uh, these are more Bibles as textbooks for schools in South Sudan. We helped start 100 primary schools in South Sudan, books for their libraries. A ton of Bibles came in by the Cessna caravan, and missionaries had to rebuild this bridge. The bridge had been blown up by the Arabs, but now made a footbridge over it in order to get the Bibles to one side and to where there's the airstrip uh, and uh, patients to the other side where there's the hospital. We flew in many tons of Bibles behind enemy lines, sometimes in these DC-3s, these Dakotas, the Second World War vintage aircraft, um, in this case, this is an ex-South Afghan Air Force um, DC-3 turboprop conversion, and uh, the pilot is also a South Afghan Air Force chap, now flying as a mercenary and offloading the Bibles inside the Nuba Mountains. This is an historic flight. It's the largest ship in the Bibles ever smuggled to an Islamic country in one go, and there's 9,800 Bibles and New Testaments in seven different languages. The land over there, we bought in Transvaal and drove overland all the way to Sudan to provide an ambulance for the hospital. The DC-3 South African Air Force, uh, DC-3 now being flown by a private charter company from Kenya. And this airstrip used to be an Arab-controlled airstrip. It was uh, the first time any uh, Christians were landing on this airstrip had been in the hands of the Arabs just a few weeks before. And almost all these bombs were distributed into newly liberated territory. One occasion I flew in and we uh, met the Krongo people who had been asked by the head of OM, George Verver, to find and to find out more about them. And these Krongo people are meant to be an unreached people group, but I found thousands of Christians amongst the Krongo and took in hymn books, prayer books, and Bibles for them, New Testaments for them. And here they are singing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing um, out of their hymn books uh, as we arrived at the airstrip. During my ministry in Sudan, I conducted over 1,200 meetings inside Sudan. And that included chaplain services with the soldiers at the battlefront, um, right at the forward areas in Noob Mountains as well, and church conferences, church services, meetings with the elders and town council people, ministering in Noob Mountains. Here, the governor organized a whole series of meetings for me to minister to his troops in Noob Mountains. And Nuba Mountains is like an area the size of Scotland, and uh, it's mountainous. Main, you can sort of imagine if you think of Table Mountain and the Hottentots Hond and the Helderberg with a big plain between. And so the people are on the tops of the mountains, and it's about the same distance between, the same heights. We would have to minister from one side of the mountains through to the other and walk across the plains that were controlled by the Arabs. 
This church was bombed 14 times in just a 12-month period. No, 18 times. Correction. And I went there to encourage them, and they ended up encouraging me. The church building was full, despite there being a large amount of bomb craters all around the church building. Despite being bombed by the Arabs multiple times, 18 times in the previous 12 months, the people didn't let that stop them gathering for worship. Now, I also, during the same time, conducted more than a thousand meetings on radio, TV, and public meetings internationally to campaign for South Sudan's independence, especially in the United States and Britain and around Europe. And we produced posters for Pray for Sudan, newsletters on Sudan, posters to pray for the countries in the Muslim Middle East, and the book, Faith Under Fine Sudan. I produced three different editions. The first edition, we doubled the size by the second edition, and we trebled the size of the first edition in the third edition, going right up to independence, um, giving the whole story of Sudan's fight for independence. And that's one great example that Sudan was, South Sudan was able to break away from Sudan. Sudan was the largest country in Africa, not anymore. One third broke away in, 19, uh, in 2011 and is now independent. Now, I never considered myself a cameraman, let alone a videographer, but I bought a video camera and learned how to use it because I knew nobody knew what was going on in Sudan. I had to take documentary evidence. And some of, these, uh, some of the footage of my very unprofessional attempts ended up in films like Sudan, Hidden Holocaust, and Terrorism and Persecution, Understanding Islamic Jihad, and Samaritan's Persis films as well, because um, there was just no real footage on the bombed schools and the bombed churches and the atrocities being committed. The people whose limbs had been cut off, amputations, and so on. I then brought in professional filmmakers like Pat Matriciano of Jeremiah Films to produce Sudan and the Holocaust, Terrorism and Persecution, and Samaritan's Purse. Franklin Graham gave me his film crew and teams, and we helped them produce some great films that helped establish the hospital that had been pioneered by the missionary Dr. Fraser and Louis, and that hospital was then used by Samaritan's Purse. Initially, even the leaders of the Sudanese People's Liberation Army, the SPLA, were skeptical that the map could ever get redrawn because the African Union had resisted all changes to the borders delineated in the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. There wasn't a single African at the Berlin Conference. Nevertheless, uh, the African Union doesn't want to change the maps. Many times they've just used a ruler and used lines of latitude and longitude or a river to separate countries. And yet, uh, I mean, it just doesn't make sense because you get the same tribe of people on both sides. I strenuously argued with Colonel John Gurang, the leader, the founder of the SPLA, and Commander Silver Kier, the second command. That's John Gurang, second from the left, and Commander Silver Kier, second from the right. And uh, I, com I argued with them that only independence for South Sudan could secure their future and their freedom. They were saying, that's a nice idea, but it'll never happen. African Union would never accept it. It's not possible. All we can do is fight for autonomy. And you can see I, I sort of redrew the map somewhat on this between Sudan and South Sudan, uh, New Sudan as we called it, and uh, started teaching them you must redraw the map, recognizing that yes, while Muslims are the majority in Sudan, Christians are the majority in the south of Sudan. And if you redraw the map, you can be the majority in your own country because you will always be a persecuted black Christian minority in an Arab majority country, unless you redraw the maps that South Sudan is a new and independent country. And here's Silver Kier arguing with me in 2002 that's not possible. Nice idea. But anything less than independence would mean the continuation of oppression by the Arab North. You would be a minority in your own country. Even though blacks are a majority in South Sudan, they were a minority in the whole of Sudan. The missionaries had actually pleaded with Great Britain back in 1955 not to include the black Christians and animists of the South in an Arab-ruled Sudan. They made suggestions, please incorporate Equatoria into Kenya or Uganda, but to no avail. The British decided to just stick with the Berlin Conference borders of, of 1885, and that was it. From the first day of independence, the 1st of January 1956, as the British left, the Arab North sought to Arabize and Islamize the South with brutal oppression, great devastation, great loss of life. Fri Sunday was abolished as day of rest. Sunday is a school day, work day. Friday is your day of rest, and so on. And 
you've got to learn Arabic, you're beaten at school. Children are wrapped over their knuckles for talking their own language. Children are made to stand out in the open holding a brick in each hand, um, reciting the Quran and speaking Arabic. If they, if they lowered their arms, they got beaten with a cane. Um, they, if they spoke in their own language, they got beaten, you had to speak Arabic. Arabization, Islamization. Girls found their names changed. Mary became Miriam, and uh, you know, John became Abdullah, and so on, and you all must just uh, have Muslim names, speak Arabic, and they sought to Arabize and Islamize the South, and there was resistance from the beginning. I showed from Sudan's history and from the teachings of Islam on jihad why the only way to be free of Sharia law and Arab oppression was to fight for full independence and for the sovereignty of South Sudan and New Mountains. I preached this all over in the chaplain services and with the troops throughout South Sudan. And although they were highly skeptical that this was possible, today South Sudan is an independent country. And Commander Silver Gear, in the middle of this picture to my left, uh, here, and we've got the governor of Equatoria right here on the far right, um, Bishop Bulanduli, whose brother was murdered by the Arabs. Um, they poured gasoline over his brother and set him alight and then towed him behind a vehicle. Um, Bulanduli was a good friend of ours. We walked many, many kilometers together ministering all over Equatoria. Well, this man, Commander Silver Kier, is now the first president of South Sudan since 9th of July, 2011. The theme we used for Sudan's independence was, let my people go from Exodus, the words that God gave for Moses to declare to Pharaoh. Let my people go, that they may worship me. And so this was the movement for separation and uh, the referendum, when people had voted for the referendum, they got the ink on their finger. That shows the people that they voted. First time they had the chance to vote ever. And here, celebrating independence on the 11th of July, 2011. A tremendous occasion, a phenomenal um, achievement. And the Christians of South Sudan now were free. And these are some of the veterans who'd lost limbs in the war. And trying this business of white gloves and ankle guards. I don't think that really suits the people of South Sudan. You can't even begin to imagine how hot it is in Equatoria to force these guys to wear white cotton gloves. I mean, really, whose idea was that? But South Sudan seceded from Sudan in 2011, the youngest country in the world, South Sudan. Commander Silver Kier, with his cowboy hat, and you may wonder what's the story behind this cowboy hat. Well, he was a guest of of George Bush Jr. in Texas, and George Bush gave him this hat, and so he's worn it like a crown ever since. And uh, he is very proud of that. And it's our friend Franklin Graham who introduced him to his friend George Bush, and uh, that and that started a relationship between George Bush and Silver Kier. And here he is on Independence Day, lifting up the new Constitution of South Sudan. What do you think a person like this is thinking? He's lost both his hands in the war. Arabs probably chopped him off as part of Sharia law, raising the stumps of his arms in praise to God for a free and independent country. From today, our identity is Southern and African, not Arabic and Islamic. We're not worse Arabs, but we are better Africans. New flag, new dawn, new history. And they've celebrated every year the independence from Sudan. And this is in Juba, the new capital of South Sudan. And plainly, you can see it. It's not stupid and unworkable to have free and independent countries. Secession is viable. It's happened. It's happened in my lifetime, in my uh, experience. I've seen it. I've been eyewitness to it. And here they've got their own flag, their own emblem of the fish eagle, their own currency, Sydney's pound, free at last. That says it all. Now, unfortunately, they discovered oil in the south, so that's been a bone of contention that's led to further conflict with the north. It's a bit of a curse to have oil in your country, it seems. We need to continue to pray for South Sudan and for the Nuba Mountains. We continue to campaign for freedom and independence for the Nuba Mountains of Sudan, then island of Christianity and the Sea of Islam. The Nuba Mountains is culturally southern, but they are geographically still in the north. They're part of South Kordofan on the border. And for some reason, the map didn't and redrawing didn't include the Nuba Mountains. So those poor souls are still in need. We sent teams to deliver Bibles and Christian books to them. We've just read hundreds of thousands of Bibles and Christian books into Nuba Mountains and very important operations that need to continue to be done. And the South Sudanese children uh, in the Nuba Mountains are being taught English. And so we've delivered Bibles for them to learn the English with the Bible as their main textbook. 
Barbados and Newport Mountains. And this is one of our priority projects to continue to provide Bibles and audio Bibles for them. And so we've had teams driving from here, from Livingston House in Cape Town, all the way up to the Nuba Mountains. The courageous Nuba Christians continue to resist the Arabization, the Islamization policies of the Khartoum government in South Kordofan. Redrawing of the map is absolutely essential to recognize ethno-linguistic demographic realities, to avoid further loss of life and further conflict. It's worth pointing out that Hebrews were Hebrews. Even after 480 years in Egypt, the Hebrews did not become Egyptians. And when our Lord gave the Great Commission, he used the word, make disciples of every nation. He used the word, ethni. Make disciples of every ethni. Now, we get confused when the word nation, and we think United Nations. Well, the bunch of human traffickers, cocaine-sniffing drug addicts and drug traffickers in New York, they're a bunch of gangsters with flags. They're not nations. Most of the state representatives in New York at the UN are not demographically elected. They've got no mandate. They've got no legitimacy. And so when people think of nations, don't think of South Africa as a nation. South Africa is not one nation. South Africa's got 11 national languages. It's at least 11 languages, at least 11 nations. You can't think of Sudan as, as one nation. Sudan's multiple languages. 144 languages in Sudan, 27 languages in South Sudan. And so you've got to think of ethno-linguistic people groups when you think of the Great Commission. You can't just think we have a missionary in China. Do you know how many language groups are in China? There are 1,300 language groups just in Indonesia. We mustn't continue to follow in the footsteps of failure. Centralization in a unitary state is as doomed to failure as the Tower of Babel. And speaking of the Tower of Babel, think of the United Nations, United, European Union. On the left, you've got the famous Renaissance portrait of the Tower of Babel. In the middle, you've got the European Union's uh, poster, Europe, many tongues, one voice. And look at the stars of the EU. They invert it so that it's not with the the star pointing upwards, but it's like a goat's head, the occultic pentagram. So you've got the goat's horns, the goat's ears, and the goat's beard. And so this is an occultic symbol, and the European Union is built deliberately to look like the old incomplete building with scaffolding around of the Tower of Babel, reaching towards the skies. And I've been there. This is the EU's building, a very strange design, deliberately building their parliament to emulate the Tower of Babel as a depicted in popular drawings. Incomplete scaffolding reaching up the skies. We need to emulate examples of excellence like the decentralized model of Switzerland, not the centralization like Babylon and uh, the EU. Switzerland is the oldest republic in the world. Now, if somebody wants to say that uh, secession is stupid and unworkable, well, think of Switzerland. Switzerland is a result of decentralization. Switzerland is a result of secession. Switzerland seceded from Austria in 1291. Do you think Switzerland's unworkable and stupid? Here's the parliament building in Bern, and uh, what a magnificent country. And they have these uh, community meetings, the Landgemeins, where the people gather together for referendums and open discussions about important subjects that decide the fate of their communities. A very decentralized country. And then think of the free enterprise model of Singapore. Singapore seceded from Malaysia. Singapore has now got a bigger economy than Malaysia, even though Singapore is on a little island marsh land with no natural resources. And yet Singapore is now an economic powerhouse. We've got many of our Bibles printed in Singapore because Singapore can print more Bibles much cheaper than any country in Africa will offer us. I can print five times more Bibles for the same price in Singapore as we can get them printed in Kenya. And that includes the cost of shipping the Bibles through to Kenya for going into Sudan. Singapore um, seceded from Malaysia in 1965, and they're doing super well. Much bigger economy than the country they seceded from. Why? Tax haven and strict law and order. Well, what's stupid and unworkable about Singapore? The Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885 sought to avoid conflict by regulating European protectorates and colonies in Africa, they wanted to effectively eradicate the slave trade, and they wanted to avoid conflict between the European powers. The Berlin Conference wasn't having a bad intention. Uh, they actually were also trying to prevent the rising American, Russian, and Japanese encroachments on Africa. Imagine Africa's history if they'd been 
actually colonized by Japan, Russia, or America. Um, I think the people in Africa can thank God for who they were colonized by. And in fact, those who were colonized by Protestant countries like Germany, the Netherlands, um, Britain did much, much, much better than those colonized by France or by Belgium uh, or Portugal, Catholic countries. The literacy rate in Protestant countries is always double that of in Catholic countries. And if you've got any multi-party democracy in Africa, if you've got any free, free newspapers in Africa, it's in countries that have got a Protestant heritage, not the Catholic heritage, which tend to be more totalitarian. So the Berlin Conference wasn't all bad, but there wasn't a single African there, and they didn't consider demographic realities. Due to lack of information and very incomplete understanding of the realities of Africa, they often drew borders along lines of latitude and longitude, literally with a ruler, and sometimes they used the river. But the fact that tribes and nations live on both sides of those arbitrary border markings was probably not realized at the time. But my missionary work has become clear the map does need to be redrawn. Half of the Shangon people live in Mozambique and speak Portuguese, and the other half live in South Africa and speak English. Half of the Avambo people live in Angola, where they've learned Portuguese and drive on the right hand side of the road, whereas the other half of the Avambo live in southwest Africa, Namibia, learning Afrikaans or English and driving on the left hand side of the road. And moreover, they're in two different time zones, despite being immediately north and south of one another. And then you get the Chichewa people who divided between Malawi, Ch Zambia, and Mozambique. And you could continue throughout Africa. There's a lot of demographic imbecilities about the Berlin Conference's maps. They do not make demographic sense. The greatest conflicts in Africa, including the Biafran Civil War in Nigeria from 67 to 1970, and most of the Congo Wars and the long conflicts in Sudan, could have all been averted if the maps had been redrawn and reflected demographic realities. If people hadn't been forced to be minorities in their own countries and oppressed by other tribes, cultures, and religions, you could have had a much more peaceful Africa. And particularly, we know that that's true in Sudan. If the British had listened to the missionaries and given South Sudan independence, or made South Sudan part of Kenya or Uganda, where they would be with fellow black Christians, not part of Muslim North of Sudan, history would have been very different and millions of people would be alive today. And you think of Nigeria. The British were also encouraged to redraw the map here. But the Muslims who lived in the north didn't want the south to go free because the Ibu and the, especially uh, the Ibu, because they lived amongst the oil rich delta in the south. In Nigeria, the oil's in the south. And so the Arabs wanted to be sure that they were part of the oil rich south so that they didn't have to do any work, you know, just of oil. And so there was a terrible civil war because the Ibu Christians happened to have most of the oil. And you can see there's many different linguistic groupings in Africa. And so the reality of Africa's demographics should be reflected in the maps. And different ways of looking at linguistic family groups. There are 3,000 language groups in Africa, by the way. 3,000. It's inexcusable that since independence, the Organization of African Unity has steadfastly refused to allow maps to be redrawn. You can't really blame the Berlin Conference. They didn't know as much in the 1850s as the people in the African Union, Union have known. But they have been deaf to the pleas of groups like the Ibu in uh, Nigeria to redraw the map. And they didn't care about Sudan for many years either. But this is the way most people want to see Africa in terms of political entities. But remember, biblically, a nation is an ethno-linguistic people group of a shared faith. The apparent exception, you could say, was Eritrea. But Eritrea was a separate entity. Before the Second World War, Eritrea was a separate country. And only after the Second World War did the Allies force Eritrea and Abyssinia together into a new country called Ethiopia. And this led to a long-standing civil war until Eritrea's independence was re-established in 1991. So the redrawing of the maps and the recognition of the independence of South Sudan is monumentally important. It's a precedent. Because Eritrea is the only redrawing of the map, apparently, but that wasn't a real redrawing of the map. It was just going back to the pre-Second World War map, which had been recognized by the Berlin Conference anyway. So here we are in the Cape. And the percentage of Afrikaners shown in the blue and the percentage of black immigrants seen on the right, you can plainly see there's an interesting thing between these two maps, and it's the r rainfall. To the right, you get a lot plentiful rainfall. To the left, you get very inadequate rainfall. And 
Afrikaans speakers have tended to be mostly concentrated on the western side of the country, where there's very low rainfall, especially in the Karoo. And they managed to eke out an existence in uh, the Karoo and Kalahari. Well, most of the people in uh, the Western Cape speak Afrikaans as a home language. Most of those on the right do not speak Afrikaans as a home language. And so here's just showing, you could also redraw the map in terms of showing who votes for the ANC and who doesn't. Well, in this upper room, we've gathered together Cape Independence Groups, Cape Exit, Cape Independence Party, Freedom Front Plus, others, Cape Independence Action Group, uh, strategists, businessmen, and we've discussed uh, Cape Freedom. We've organized marches like Marching for Freedom on Freedom Day, 27th of April, 2022, march through Cape Town, calling for Cape Independence and Cape uh, uh, Self-Determination, which is guaranteed in our constitution the right of any people group to declare self-determination. And so marching for Western Cape um, Independence uh, through the Cape, past the Parliament, and we had support of these different um, Free the Cape movements that support self-determination. And outside the provincial Parliament, uh, we delivered our demands, memorandum, uh, petition, and yes for Cape independence. The Cape independence flag, which has got the anchor, we have an anchor, which has always been a symbol of Cape Town for nearly 500 years, um, as a tavern of the seas. Marching through the streets of Cape Town, we found a lot of support from passers-by, and there's no doubt that this was enthusiastically supported. Cape Independence is an idea whose time has come. And there's many looking at this saying, this is a good idea. Now, just think of this, for example. Do you know that for every rand we spend in taxes, the Western Cape gets back less than 12 cents of every rand. We don't have any economic incentives to stay in the Union. Do you know that we wouldn't have any power failures in the Western Cape if we were independent? We've got enough electricity for the Western Cape. The only reason we have power failures scheduled is because we're on the national grid and we have to share with other parts of the country. So the Cape is being abused. This is an abusive relationship. We don't normally support divorce, but in the case of where there's abuse, then sometimes divorce is better than abuse. And so in this case, it's like we need to have a velvet divorce, just like Czech and Slovakia. Like, you know, we don't want to be part of this failed state anymore. The cancer government is just looting and abusing. They're not serious about protecting the population. Now, the Premier of the Western Cape has the power Alan Wendy, as Premier of the Western Cape, can call for a referendum on any issue at any time. That is constitutionally part of the uh, powers that a Premier of a province has, to call for referendums. And right now they're discussing devolution. The DA is wanting to, and they promised in the last elections, vote for us and we will go for provincial control of railways, provincial control of water, provincial control of electricity, and provincial control of the policing all of which the vast majority of people in the Cape voted for. But when they got into power they, they, in the Western Cape, they didn't go further. So now they're seeking for devolution powers that they can actually do what they promised to do in the last elections in which the voters empowered them to do, which is to be able to give to the province the control of our own electricity, our own railways, our own water, and our own police. And so here we are at a major crossroads of decision, and I believe our experience is learning from uh, the examples of excellence which have succeeded. This is the cover of the book we've sent into the printer uh, this week. And I think just the cover gives the story in the case. Starting with Switzerland in the middle, going right, Netherlands, America, these are countries that result from secession. Are any of these countries stupid and unworkable? Switzerland, Netherlands. Netherlands secede from Spain. United States secede from Britain. Belgium seceded from Netherlands. Texas secede from Mexico, Nicaragua secede from Guatemala, Norway secede from Sweden back in 1905, Finland seceded from Russia in 1917, and India, Ireland. sorry, Ireland, Ireland seceded from Great Britain in 1922, Pakistan seceded from India, and then uh, Taiwan seceded from China, Singapore seceded from Malaysia, uh, Bangladesh seceded from uh, Pakistan. Remember, there was East Pakistan, West Pakistan. So East Pakistan seceded from West Pakistan. Namibia seceded from South Africa in 1990. They're actually doing better than we are right now. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia seceded from Russia. Croatia, Slovenia, and uh, 
Croatia, Slovenia, what are we talking about there? East Timor. East Timor, and uh, then we are dealing with, is that Slovakia? That's Slovakia, yes. And then we've got South Sudan, which is the youngest country in the world. And then the Cape Independence flag, um, hopefully the next country in the line of secession. So just there, on the front cover, we already give the case for Cape secession. And uh, on the back cover, having a Swiss flag reminding us of the freest uh, country in the world, the highest uh, standard of living in the world, Switzerland. Um, how can one say that that is stupid and unworkable? Let my people go reminds us that Israel grew out of secession from Egypt. And by the way, when, nor when the northern kingdoms decided to secede from Judah and King Rehoboam wanted to raise an army of 180,000 to go and fight them and force them to rejoin, the prophet came and gave a word from the Lord, go home, do not fight your brethren, this is of me. So the secession of northern kingdoms from the southern kingdom is specifically said in the scripture, this is of me. Do not resist them. Do not fight your brethren. Go back to your homes. And so this is our flag. It's got um, sort of echoes of our heritage and history. The Dutch flag is partly visible. The Christian cross, the anchor of Cape Town. We have an anchor. We've campaigned for Cape Independence for years. We've got audiovisual and DVD um, presentations on it. You can see these on the Frontline Mission SA.org website. And we've got a new Cape of Good Hope, Cape of Good Hope dot online website. The story of how South Sudan got its independence is very relevant because that's Africa. That's the most recent secession in history. And there's a lot of other history we can learn from, like our South African history, sketches of South African history, which is also available as print on demand in ebooks. Mm -hmm.